Hello, I'm Chris Sullivan, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest installment in our Swiss Re Corporate Solutions Risk Management Series, Nature Meets Technology, Using Data Analytics to Protect Your Business from a Hailstorm. Today, you'll hear from Cole Mayer, who has considerable experience structuring innovative risk solutions, including the parametric hail products you'll hear about shortly. And I also have Megan Lincoln, a senior NatCat underwriter responsible for structuring index-based NatCat solutions for our customers. Many of you are familiar with the drill, but before we get started, just a few logistical items. You can submit questions at any point during the session via the Q&A chat box. We've left time at the end to review those questions with you. And if you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please hit Control F5 for a refresh. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Cole Mayer to kick us off. Thank you very much, Chris. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. I uh, hope everybody continues to be uh, safe in, in this challenging time. So um, speaking of, of challenging times, we thought it would be um, uh, kind of interesting before we start to go through uh, how exactly the Hale parametric cover works, um, just to kind of paint a, a brief picture as to the challenges uh, that our uh, insureds are facing and in the, in the backdrop uh, kind of with which or under which uh, this, this cover was kind of built. Um, so uh, none of these will be a surprise to any of you um, on the call, uh, but just to kind of, again, to paint a picture, um, a, a number of, of very real and difficult challenges facing us all, uh, including our insureds. Uh, so the first, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, um, is, is the COVID-19 uh, challenges. So, you know, obviously uh, a, a plethora of different um, uh, difficulties presented by the current pandemic. Uh, among those, you know, uncertainty around revenue streams, uh, both now and, and going forward, uh, uncertainty with respect to um, ongoing customer behavior um, in, in terms of kind of different products uh, or services that our insurers are selling, along with you know, uh, challenges in terms of predicting, you know, the, the regulatory um, situation, shutdowns, um, no shutdowns, et cetera. So a very, very challenging time with considerable uncertainty for our insureds. Uh, and, and unfortunately, um, certainly here in the U.S., those disruptions will likely continue uh, for some time. Uh, in conjunction with that, uh, again, no news to anybody on the line, uh, but there is a very difficult market situation and environment for many of our insurers. Um, so, you know, obviously due to continued losses over many years, attritional and, and cat losses um, on the hail side, insurers are shifting their underwriting standards with respect to how they approach hail exposed accounts. So, so that can take many different forms or, or a combination uh, of, of forms. One might be increased rates, so we're seeing that you know, across the property world in general uh, and, and even outside of property. There are also uh, very likely will be increased hail deductibles or retentions, as well as potentially new uh, or lower hail sublimits. This is especially true in certain classes of business, solar for example, where uh, historically, there weren't sublimits, uh, and now there are, uh, and, and sometimes relatively low sublimits. So uh, in conjunction with COVID-19 and all of the challenges that that presents, uh, there, you know, certainly a difficult market environment for our insurers as well, specifically with respect to hail. And finally, the third, the third piece there, uh, again, kind of no, no secret. Uh, we've all kind of felt this, I think, over the years, but just an increased overall hail loss frequency and severity. Uh, so there's just more stuff in hail exposed areas <laughs> than there was historically. So the same storm, all things being equal, causes more damage. Uh, there are also, you know, some climatological uh, kind of factors that Megan will uh, talk about later as well. Uh, but, but certainly these three factors um, kind of coalesce to a very, very challenging uh, situation and environment for our insureds. So our contention is, and, and, and really our team's mandate, is to develop solutions to help our insured solve these emerging problems. So, um, uh, and what we'll kind of explore later is, 
we firmly believe that parametric covers, parametric hail product uh, that, that we'll kind of outline for you briefly later, can help our insureds solve these problems uh, and, and to alleviate maybe not all of the pain, uh, but, but hopefully some of the pain uh, associated with those problems. So, so before we go uh, into how uh, the, the, kind of the, the actual hail insurance cover works that we've designed, I thought it would be good to just briefly do a refresher on what parametric insurance is. Uh, so some of you may have joined our previous webinar that spelled out um, uh, you know, so how parametric insurance works, used a couple examples, did kind of a deep dive on hurricane and earthquake. Um, but, but, so I apologize for those who, who may have already joined, and this may be um, uh, a bit of a refresher, but, but hopefully for some this will be kind of a good uh, grounding discussion. So uh, what is parametric insurance? Just, just very briefly, um, what we're trying to do here is ultimately develop a pre-agreed trigger. So in this case, uh, in a natural catastrophe cover, for example, it would be a physical trigger associated with the peril that allows us to, in a way, pre-adjudicate a claim. So we're using this physical parameter to pre-adjudicate or, or to um, uh, sort of simulate, if you will, the, the loss that the insured will experience. Uh, so this pre-agreed trigger, you can see a list of, of a couple there. Hailstone size, which is very pertinent to the conversation we're having today. Uh, many others you can choose, hurricane wind speed, earthquake, shake intensity. Uh, so ultimately what we're doing is um, we're, we, the insurer and insured, are agreeing on uh, a pre-agreed trigger. Uh, and if that trigger is hit, according to our third-party data provider, we would cut a check, right? usually quite quickly after an event. So if we look at the claims process on the right there, um, the, the little picture you can see um, at the top there is, flash that there, the um, event occurs. So that's the kind of the top picture there. Um, once the event occurs, what we would do very quickly thereafter is determine the event intensity from our third-party data provider. So for example, again, that might be the hailstone size, that might be wind speed, hurricane shake, in, or earthquake shake intensity, rather. Um, so a number of different metrics you can use. But ultimately, what we're doing is we're, we're determining the intensity of the event uh, immediately after it occurs. So once that uh, intensity is reported from our data provider, we determine, based on our, our pre-agreement, whether the trigger threshold was met. Right, so, so the trigger threshold or the payout threshold would be something like um, we will pay you, the insured, X amount of money if the event is this intense or higher, for example. Right? So we're determining uh, whether that trigger was hit. Once we determine that trigger is hit, we would pay the insured what is owed under the contract. Again, typically quite quickly, uh, usually within 30 days of the event. Okay, that last step there, this loss confirmation step, so it is an important point. I won't go in too much detail with this, but um, these are insurance contracts. Uh, and, and so as a result, the insured, uh, from a regulatory perspective, cannot profit from an insurance policy. Uh, so, so the way that we handle that is um, we go through those top four steps that we just discussed, a payment is issued to the insured, again, typically very quickly after the event. The insured then has a, a preset period of time. So typically that's about a year for the insured to, to use those funds and kind of see how that loss evolves over time. So, so to kind of track this, the insured gets paid immediately after the event. They have a year to use those funds for any loss associated with the event as that develops. And, and it, it is that broad, and we'll get into the, that kind of benefit of parametric in just a minute. Uh, so after that year, the insured has kind of seen how the loss evolves over time. Then the insured attests that, yes, I have in fact had at least the amount of loss equal to or greater than the payout that you paid me in step four there. Okay, so, so quite a simple uh, claims adjustment process. 
um, it, it's going to be much more streamlined than you would typically see in a traditional property policy, for example. Okay, so if we look at uh, the typical, what we call backbone of a parametric insurance policy, so you can kind of see um, four steps there. Um, the, the first is we're defining a location or collection of locations. So that's um, simply put a latitude longitude point on the map. Right? We're also then defining a limit. So how much, uh, what's effectively the policy limit? Right? We're defining our data provider. Uh, so that's our independent third party data provider. Very, very important for any parametric cover. For our hail cover, we use CoreLogic, which Megan will get into in detail in a few minutes. Uh, but the key is picking a, a, a very dependable, reliable, uh, and granular third-party data provider. So that's a key component. The fourth step is developing a payout table. So we touched on that in the previous slide, but this is effectively how much we will pay you, the insured, at a given intensity. So you can see an example here uh, on the right. So this uh, is, is, in fact, a maximum hail size. So this is how we would approach, for example, our hail parametric product. And then the percentage of the limit at a given intensity or at a given hail size. And so, so typically what we would do with a payout table is we would scale it up as the intensity increases. Right? So as the intensity of the event increases, the corresponding payout would increase. So that sort of simulates, you know, as the intensity of the event increases, we would expect the insured to feel more pain. So as a result, we're going to pay more money. So these are kind of the four main components of really any parametric insurance policy that you might see. So why do folks buy parametric covers? Um, there are kind of three main benefits, very high level benefits. Uh, and within these, you can kind of use these benefits or features very creatively. And, and we'll talk about uh, a few of those in just a minute. Uh, but the three kind of high level benefits are uh, the first is speed. So we've, we've touched on that again uh, briefly. Uh, but, but by pre-adjudicating the claim, again, with this pre-agreed trigger, what we're able to do is confirm that the loss happened or con confirm the intensity quite quickly after the event. Right? So um, with, our, with our data provider, we, we know quite quickly what the intensity was. We can compare that to the pre-agreed uh, payout table very quickly. And as a result, we can pay quite quickly, uh, typically much quicker than your typical traditional property and pol policy might adjust. So what this means is a, a parametric insurance policy is actually a, a really great complement to traditional insurance. So traditional insurance, typically you can buy larger limits, um, et cetera, but it does take uh, a while longer to adjust. Right? There's, in, a, in a CAT scenario, there are typically there's, there's pressure on adjusters. Um, it takes time, particularly for more complex claims, to adjust. Um, particularly the BI side of the claim. So this is actually a great hedge uh, against the time, right? So um, an insured could buy a parametric as well as traditional. In the event of a loss, that traditional side takes a while to adjust to do what it needs to do. In the, in the interim, the insured can bridge the gap with a quick payment from a parametric cover. So the speed is, is a huge, huge benefit conveyed by these parametric covers. Uh, to dovetail with that, the, the broad cover. Uh, so this is another reason why traditional insurance comp or, or parametric insurance rather complements traditional insurance quite well. Um, so we, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but once the insured gets uh, the payment, the parametric payment, they can use those funds for any loss associated with the event. And again, it really is that broad. Um, and, and so what that allows the insured to do is get a quick hit of liquidity from the parametric cover. And this broadness of the cover allows them to fill in the gaps of their traditional cover quite well. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about some of those gaps in just a minute with a visual to help you kind of 
get a sense for how this might work and and work in conjunction with the traditional cover. But the 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 the, the coverage conveyed by a parametric cover is typically much broader than you would see in any uh, typical property policy. Finally, flexibility, uh, not just in use of the funds, which is which kind of goes with the broad cover, but also in the way that we can design these covers. So these are uh, really by by definition they're they're bespoke. In other words, they're designed very specifically for the insured with the insured's exposures in mind. So we have a lot of flexibility as a result in where we put the latitude longitude points, how we define the payout table. So it's very customizable to solve you know, a wider kind of array of problems uh, than you might be able to solve with a, tra a traditional property policy. So this slide here helps give you kind of a visual of what we were just talking about in the previous slide. So, so how can a parametric cover be used to complement a traditional insurance policy? Again, we think they work quite well together as part of a, if, if, if you will, a suite of risk management tools that you might have at your disposal. Um, so, so you can keep, see three main categories here where a parametric cover can really work quite well uh, in complement with a traditional cover. So one might be in filling a retention or deductible. So if we go back to the current environment, right, insureds are seeing significant increases in retention or deductible. Um, to the extent that they're not comfortable retaining all of that, a parametric cover can absolutely help to supplement that deductible, the fun part of that deductible. So you can see that on the left-hand side of the screen. In the middle there, uh, limit as well. So a parametric cover can not just infill the deductible, but can also help sublimit, uh, or, or supplement rather, a sublimit. Uh, so you know, again, a fairly new phenomenon, these hail sublimits that are, that are creeping in. Um, a parametric cover can, can be sort of used to supplement that sublimit to the extent that there isn't quite enough limit available in the market. Finally, uh, cover excluded expenses. Uh, so there's a lot here. Uh, you know, as, as many know who have been through a, a natural catastrophe claim, there are, there are expenses that sort of fall through the cracks uh, of, a, of a traditional property policy. Uh, and uh, you know, a, a, a traditional policy can't cover everything and can't really contemplate everything. So there are expenses that fall through the cracks uh, or that are, are excluded you know, because the, the traditional insurer just can't insure them. Uh, so you can see a few examples there on the right, uh, you know, cosmetic roof damage, for example, uh, on, on a real estate or habitational portfolio, um, or you know, maybe a roof of a certain age that, that might be um, you know, provided cover at ACV instead of replacement costs, that type of stuff. Autos in the open. You know, a huge uh, exposure, uh, and, and sometimes excluded altogether, sometimes sublimited, uh, and, and, and oftentimes very difficult to find coverage for those types of portfolios. Damage to outdoor property uh, that, that might be heavily sublimited or excluded. Uh, there's many others on the list. Uh, it, it's, it's really a, a very comprehensive list, uh, and, and we learn new every day. But um, because of the broadness of the cover that we discussed, covering these excluded expenses that sort of fall through the cracks um, are, are one of the key benefits of a parametric cover. So with that, I'll hand it over to Megan, who will give you a, a sense for um, kind of the hail situation uh, in, in the US, as well as a, a nice description of how our hail parametric insurance product works. Thank you, Cole, and thank you, everyone, for joining this afternoon. Um, so what was a, what's our reason for why we decided to concentrate on the United States first? And the reason for that is the United States is fairly hail-prone. Um, in 2019 alone, there, were over, there was over $20 billion in insured loss from severe thunderstorm-related perils, and that includes hail, tornado, and uh, straight-line winds. And the uh, central part of the United States is particularly hail prone. And the reason for that is because of the 
geography and the topography of the United States. And the schematic that is currently shown on your screen is from uh, the National Weather Service. And it is relevant for tornadoes, or the context of the map is tornadoes. However, it's the, since tornadoes and hail both occur within the same phenomenon, which is severe thunderstorm, it is relevant for hail as well. And I think it kind of paints a, a really nice picture as to why the U.S. is as prone to severe thunderstorms as it is, particularly in the part of the country where they frequently occur. Um, to the north, we have Canada, and a lot of cold, dry air originates north, north of the United States in Canada and gradually makes its way to the south. And then you also have air that originates over the Gulf of Mexico, which is going to be moist, it's going to be very warm. Water temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico are frequently between 80 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and that air is going to make its way north. And because there's no mountain range in the United States that runs from east to west, these two different types of air masses are able to collide. And when they do collide, the difference in both moisture or humidity and the difference in temperature leads to the formation of these severe thunderstorms. And these air masses are most likely to collide in the middle of the country in what is known as Tornado Alley. And that is what is shown in the red footprint there. And that's also where we get these severe storms that generate uh, significant hail size. So it's for that reason that we both have hail that occurs in the United States. And, it's, and the, where these air masses collide is also why the central part of the United States is particularly particularly prone to damaging severe thunderstorms, damaging hail, damaging tornadoes. So Cole gave a really great background as to how parametric products worked, how we, how we see the proceeds used, but how do we go through the process of actually structuring a hail cover? Well, the first key to structuring any parametric product, including our hail parametric product, is to know exactly where your assets are located and know how much insurance you, want, you would like to purchase. So that way we can allocate limits, and commonly we see limits for this particular product in the uh, low six digits to low seven digit range, so 100,000 to a million. So we need to know where exactly to allocate them and where to monitor for hail occurrence. And we refer to these as trigger locations. These are commonly provided as latitude longitudes, and these reflect where you are exposed to hail. The next thing we need to do is design the payout table, which Cole touched on a few slides ago. And that is going to uh, communicate what percentage of your limit do you would like to receive for a certain size or size range of hail. And this is going to vary. Sometimes we have very, very, um, we have very uh, stretched payout patterns where in some instances we see clients want um, a small percentage, 5 to 10 percent, every uh, quarter of an inch, for example. Other times we might see 25, 50, 75, 100 percent for every quarter of an inch. So these payout tables are very flexible and they can be designed to suit your particular needs and give you a portion of the limit depending on what your intended use of the funds is and how you might see them to be most beneficial. So we design these two, we design the limit allocation, the trigger locations, the payout table prior to the contract incepting as we're having our early conversations. And then after an event, um, we would pull the hail verification report from the team at CoreLogic and determine at the trigger locations that were defined earlier how large the hail size was. And then based on that maximum hail size at your location, we would determine what percent of the payout is due and would transfer those funds to you. Um, and then the funds could be used for any purpose that you saw fit for losses that were related to the event. Uh, and as Cole mentioned, uh, to adhere to U.S. insurance regulations, we then have a true up process that lasts for approximately a year where it allows um, the insured to demonstrate that they received funds that were not necessarily in excess of their actual incurred loss. 
So we partnered with CoreLogic on this initiative because Swiss Re has had a uh, very good working relationship with CoreLogic for a number of years, and they really are a leader in the natural catastrophe monitoring, risk assessment, and observation space. And in partnering with CoreLogic, we were both able to access their NatCat model for a severe convective thunderstorm in the United States and receive information on hail probabilities. And CoreLogic has d designed their hail probabilities based on both historical hail events and U.S. severe thunderstorm climatology. So we use them for both the uh, risk assessment phase of our product development, and we use them for their the post-event reporting as well. And CoreLogic has developed a proprietary algorithm that combines uh, radar data based on uh, radar signatures and radar images. Uh, you can determine if hail is falling in a thunderstorm, and if so, how large it is. But then CoreLogic also combines this with on-the-ground information, whether or not it's taken from uh, National Weather Service trained Skywarn spotters who go through a certification process to learn and um, understand the best way to transmit to the National Weather Service what size hail occurs. Uh, there's also information in the news media, and then even social media can be an important so important so source of weather observation information if the photos that are uploaded are geotagged with a uh, and time stamped as well to act as a further piece of verification information. So this allows us to uh, receive from CoreLogic within 24 to 48 hours after the hail event occurs how large of a hailstone fell at the relevant location to the insured. So just to summarize a little more, this is the example of our hail policy. As mentioned, in the pre-bind phase, we establish where we're going to be covering, what percentage of the limit the client would like to receive for a given hail size falling at their property, and how much overall limit they want to buy. Um, and then after the contract is in force, we monitor, our, we monitor uh, your location for hail events using CoreLogic's platform. If an event occurs, we download a hail verification report and confirm the hail size. And in the event that you were due a payout, we transmit that payout to you within several weeks after the event. So in the example on the bottom half of this slide, the hypothetical event caused hail in between 1.5 and 2 inches. So under this hypothetical policy, if an insured purchased a limit of 2.5 million and hail of 1.75 inches fell at that location, they would be eligible to receive a 50% payout or 1.25 million. So now I'm going to hand it back over to Cole for what we kind of see in what we've seen so far to date and to go into a little bit more detail as to exactly what geography and what states we're covering. So Cole, I'll hand it back on over to you. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate it. So um, I'm going to go through this slide and give a little bit of background on some of the key info for you to know uh, with respect to how we're approaching this, this hail parametric cover, uh, as well as get into kind of where we're seeing some success. So hopefully you can get a, a feel for where these are sort of landing, if you will. Uh, and I'm going to do my best not to talk too much and leave as much time for questions uh, as I possibly can here. So um, the, the first piece is availability. So that's a, a, obviously a natural question. Um, you can see a map there on the right with blue states, states that are kind of highlighted in blue. Um, no surprise, this corresponds quite well with Megan's slide a few, a few slides ago in terms of where we typically see the most significant hail. And, and for those of you who, who deal in the property space, these, this choice of states won't be a surprise to you. Right? So you've got Texas down on the south, Texas and Oklahoma, um, obviously Kansas, Colorado, and then you kind of go up to South Dakota and Minnesota. Um, Iowa, Missouri, uh, and a little bit further east from there. And, and so um, this is currently where we have the ability to price uh, and, and ultimately uh, de deliver event reports, so these 11 states. Uh, so again, this should take care of 
I would say the vast majority of insurers who, are, who would seriously consider uh, a parametric option uh, in, in terms of hail. And you can see the list of states down there on the bottom as well. In terms of target classes of business, I'll go into to this for, for just a minute to give you a feel for where we're seeing interest and, and where we're executing these deals. So, so no surprise, again, to, to many of you, uh, dealer open lot is a, is a key exposure here um, where they've, they've felt, uh, in fact, for a number of years, felt some major pain on, on the traditional insurance side uh, because of the losses uh, that they that, that continue to see. So it's very difficult over there to get uh, adequate limits, and the retentions tend to be very high, uh, and the pricing tends to be very high. And so uh, this is a very natural place uh, to plug in a parametric as a supplement to what's available on the traditional side. So the dealer open lot space, we're seeing a, a lot of interest and quite some success in terms of actually executing deals. Um, Solar is another. Uh, so solar is a is a following a couple big losses last year, very sizable losses in Texas and I believe North North Carolina. Um, they're seeing a lot of disruption in in their market and in their space. So that includes um, really kind of all of the above uh, in terms of what we explored on on slide three. There, they're seeing increased retentions. They're seeing significant hail sublimits. Um, that is impacting, for example you know, the financing of new projects, right? So there are insurance requirements around how much limit to buy uh, from lenders, uh, and that's really been a challenge in terms of building those limits to satisfy lenders and ultimately get projects off the ground. So solar is another one that's, that we've, we've had many, many fruitful discussions. Real estate in general, so we talked about a couple examples there, uh, you know, roof, for example, uh, that might be cosmetic, older roofs, et cetera. Uh, there are many others as well. Uh, so, so public entity is another one uh, that where we've had many discussions and some success there as well. So managing, um, you know, a, a fleet risk within a public entity, for example. You know, this this product um, is very localized, and so it does require um, some pretty detailed uh, discussion between us, the broker, and the insured. Uh, in terms of where exactly to put those pins, right? So it's a very localized peril. It's a very localized product by design. And so, for example, on the public entity side, we might say, okay, they have a, say it's a county, they have a very big footprint, but let's dig into where you, the insured, are really concerned, right? And so once you kind of peel back some of the layers there, you can get very specific. So, you know, for example, you can put a point where they keep um, their, their, some fleet, right, some police cars, for example, a point where they know they have maybe a susceptible roof, right? So um, the, the, one of the keys to this product, particularly when you're dealing with schedules, um, is getting very specific uh, with the discussion with respect to where the insured is really concerned and where the insured really has that exposure. Because it is a very localized peril and, and as a consequence, a very localized product design. So in terms of available limit, um, we at this point uh, are comfortable putting out up to two and a half million per location or site. Um, so maybe just to elaborate on that a little bit, uh, for insureds who have, for example, you know, multiple um, different kind of geographic areas of exposure. You know, we might be able to, to do, for example, you know, one, two, two and a half million in one geographic area, and then, you know, uh, one or two, two and a half million in another, right, so provided that it's sufficiently far away, right? So, so this is sort of an accumulation in a given um, uh, kind of exposed area, if you will. Uh, so, you know, it, it, we, we certainly realize that it's not, uh, these limits aren't massive, um, but for what the insureds that we discuss tend to want to use these for, uh, primarily supplementing traditional insurance, it actually can still be very powerful uh, in, in terms of how they can be used. So a, a ballpark, this, this is always the million dollar question, um, ballpark rates online. Uh, so this is very, very kind of rule of thumb. Okay, so, so these can vary, these rates online can vary 
significantly based on the geographic area, so, so where you are. Right? So for example, North Texas, Oklahoma, kind of the heart of Tornado Alley that, that Megan mentioned a few slides ago, that's going to be considerably more expensive than an equivalent payout table you know, in, for example, Minnesota. Right? Uh, so it's, it's, it's going to vary very significantly depending on the geographic area. It will also vary based on the payout table you choose. Right? So if you have a payout table that attaches quite low, right? so, so you know, meaningful payouts in, say, the you know, 1.25 inch range, uh, right? it's a little bit more frequent, it's going to be more expensive. Right? So you have a more sensitive, lower attaching cover. Uh, so it's going to be correspondingly more expensive. Uh, and, and the converse is also true. So if you, if you raise that, those payout thresholds, that would then decrease the price. So pricing is, is very sensitive to those two kind of key components. Uh, and by rates online, you, we simply mean premium divided by limit. Right? So that's, that's kind of what we mean by, by rate online, just to kind of give you a flavor. So um, a, a, a very rough range uh, you know, this isn't, this isn't cheap, <laughs> right? So, so just to kind of manage expectations there, um, it's not, uh, you know, going to be, for example, considerably cheaper than traditional cover. It just behaves differently, right? And, and so that's why they actually complement each other quite well. But we also want to just manage expectations from, from that perspective. So a, a rough range, to, to just give you a rule of thumb, would, on a net basis, would be a 7% rate online range, kind of on the low end, to it can be as high as 18%, almost 20% um, on the high end. And that, so that 18% would be, for example, you know, for a, a, a kind of standard payout table in Oklahoma City, right, for example. So that would be uh, about as exposed as you can get in geographically and, and not a super high attaching cover. Uh, and then it obviously would kind of adjust down from there. But just to give you a rough range uh, in, in terms of expectation, as you have conversations you know, with, with your management team on the insured side uh, or uh, with, with your clients on, on the broker side. And we're happy to explore this in more detail with respect to specific account exposure. So with that, Chris, I hope I've left enough to, uh, ample time for questions. Look forward to, to the question piece. I'll hand it back to you. Great. Oh, Thank I'm sorry. You, so one, uh, one more. Yeah, sorry, Chris. I, I forgot the, the next slide there. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a quick plug for the, the IRS team. My, my apologies there. Uh, so this is our innovative risk solution team here in the States. Uh, and, and so uh, we have representation on the East Coast. Um, so so uh, Bob Nussline, who heads up our team, sits in New York, as well as Todd Chima. Uh, we have Yusuf um, uh, Baki up in Toronto. So we actually have a Canadian presence as well. And then on the West Coast, we have Scott Carpenteri, who sits in Los Angeles, and, and myself in, in San Francisco. So, so feel free to reach out to any one of us. Our contact information is there. Um, for inquiries on anything uh, unique and, and interesting and innovative if an insured has a problem that isn't readily solved on the traditional side, uh, but also with respect to hail specifically. You can reach out to any of us. So Chris, with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to you again. Sorry about that. No, it's great. Thank you, Cole. Appreciate that. And, uh, and Megan, thanks to you as well. That was fantastic. Uh, we're going to go into Q&A. A lot of questions have come in. Um, and just note, on the line with us, we have Curtis McDonald. Curtis is a senior product manager with CoreLogic. So if there are any questions related to CoreLogic or their methodology, Curtis is available to answer those. Uh, Cole, I, I'm going to turn the first question over to you. You kind of left us with um, some discussion around rate online. So we had a question around uh, minimum premium. So what is the minimum premium uh, for this product? Yeah, that's that's a good question, Chris. So um, Generally speaking, as we talked about, these are more customized products. So as such, it, it does take uh, a bit more heavy lifting than maybe your typical traditional deal might, both for us as well as for our brokers and our insureds. Uh, so collectively, we, we just want to make sure that that um, time is well compensated. So, so generally speaking, Chris, we would say $100,000 minimum premium. Hopefully that helps. 
No, it does. Thank you. Thanks, Cole. Um, Megan, uh, I think this one will be near and dear to your heart. There is a question about uh, the correlation between climate change and, um, and hailstorms. Thank you, Chris. Um, so currently, there's no research that has been published in any sort of in any sort of peer-reviewed academic journals that suggests there's a strong link between either the frequency or severity of hailstorms and climate change. Um, hail, tornadoes are very noisy perils, meaning that uh, there's a lot of variation in them from year to year. It's only probably been in the last 30 or so years that we even have the technology to reliably detect all storms that produce hail and tornadoes and not just the ones that we people on the ground have physically observed. So it, it's difficult to extract trends of changes in observational technology from actual physical trends due to climate change. But so far to date, there haven't been any peer-reviewed studies that suggest there's any sort of strong correlation between severe thunderstorm activity in the United States and climate change, either presently or in the future. Thank you, Megan. Uh, the next question, um, is related to, uh, Cole, I'll turn this over to you. So can we provide a hail parametric product for a portfolio of risks? That's kind of part one. And then part two would be just kind of adding on another question here around, have you found the $2.5 million limit um, sufficient enough to cover uh, the typical franchise or auto dealer's inventory? So part one, again, you know, how do you handle kind of the, um, a portfolio, and then part two, how have you found the limit to be the $2.5 million limit, the sufficiency? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So uh, with respect to the first question, the portfolio of risk, that's a really great question. I touched on it a little bit, but didn't dive too deep uh, on, on that last slide before the question. So um, uh, we, we absolutely can entertain a portfolio of risks. Um, but there's kind of a, a, a very specific way we need to attack those. So we talked about this a, a little bit before, but hail is very, very localized, right? So, uh, and, and for those of us who have lived in, in the Midwest, or, or you know, many on the phone know the peril if you haven't, um, you know, it can, you can see very significant hail, um, you know, sort of down the street from my house, for example, uh, and, and I might not get hit very hard at all or vice versa, right? So, so the peril is, is sort of hyper-localized in this way that it, it, in a way that earthquake or hurricane, for example, might not be. Um, uh, so what we need to do, that means is we need to attack these very, very granularly. So, so I'll, I'll maybe give you an example. Hopefully this will help to, to, to shed some color on this. So you know, if, for example, I'll kind of continue with the analogy we used before. So let's say you have a county. So you've got a kind of a portfolio of risk, all generally in the same geographic area, but it's pretty widespread, right? So you've got kind of stuff everywhere. Um, uh, what we would try to do is say, okay, let's, let's go much deeper in terms of where the insured is actually concerned, right? So rather than trying to digest and, and kind of eat this elephant, so to speak, right, of, of this huge portfolio of stuff everywhere in this county and trying to figure out where to put the, the different lat longs, what we might say is, let's sit down and have a discussion around, you know, you as the client know your risk very well, so let's have a discussion around where you're really concerned, right? What's, what's kind of keeping you up at night in terms of your, your hail exposure? Again, is it your, your entire collection of police cars are kept in one place, right, um, or, or, you know, two or three places, and you get a bad hail storm and that affects a large part of your fleet? you know, or, or school buses or, or whatever the case may be. Um, so maybe we put a pin there, right? And then we've got, uh, you, you know about a roof that, that's quite susceptible, right? Some of the others are fine. They're, they're well built. We're not too concerned about it, but we've got this specific roof that's a concern. We might have, you know, if, if it's a school, you might have, you know, the, the, the stadium, the football stadium, right? Might, might have a, a, a nice big scoreboard that you're pretty concerned about being affected. So um, to handle a portfolio of risk, Chris, to answer your question, we would, 
want to get much more specific around where exactly is the insured really concerned from a hail perspective. And usually, again, when you pull back some of the layers, there's a lot of, of, of areas of their portfolio that they're actually not that concerned. Uh, and then you can get much more specific in a localized way that kind of matches up with the apparel and how the product's designed. So, so hopefully that helps paint, paint kind of a picture. And we're happy to, you know, anybody who has, you know, a, a collection of risks or a portfolio, we're happy to dig deeper specific to that portfolio uh, with, with any of you. Um, on, the, on the second question, uh, is 2 million or 2.5 million sufficient? I believe, Chris, the question was around the, the auto dealer franchise, so I'll, I'll use that example, uh, and then maybe talk generally. So, so the, the short answer is, is yes. I, I, we found thus far, particularly, again, this comes back to how our insureds typically use this. Right? That's kind of the key point there, uh, which is you know, it's used as a supplement for traditional cover. Right? So what we're not trying to do is replace the entire traditional program in terms of you know, a, a, an auto dealer who has you know, say 150 or 200 units sitting on their lot. Right? They're still buying traditional cover up to the limit that they can buy. Typically, they're using this parametric cover as a much more flexible and speedy way to help supplement their retention, right? And just to get a quick influx of cash when they really need it most, right? While that traditional claim is adjusting. So from that perspective, you know, we find for the vast majority of auto dealers, two and a half million is, is more than sufficient. Um, when you get out into other occupancies, you know, that's where sometimes it, it can be a little bit more of a challenge. You know, if, if you've got a, a, a really big solar site, um, you know, is 2.5 million sufficient enough? Um, you know, that it, it's definitely a question. However, very often the conversation as well, you know, it's, it's certainly, it's still a tool. It's certainly better than, than no cover, <laughs> right? So that's kind of the alternative, uh, unfortunately. And so, you know, while, it, it, while our insureds on that side might say, yeah, we would really love more, very often it's still, well, two and a half is still actually meaningful to me. So as you extend out of auto dealers into other segments, we're finding that the two and a half million is still much more often than not very meaningful for our insureds. Hopefully that answers the question, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much, Cole. Uh, Megan, I'm going to have uh, a question for you, and then Curtis, uh, following uh, my question for Megan, I'll have, I'll have one for you. There have been a number of questions, Megan, around um, expanding kind of our, our offering footprint into Canada uh, and, and outside of North America. So we have questions around Canada, Mexico, and then outside North America. So can you talk about uh, any plans uh, in the works to expand this beyond the current footprint the solution is offered in? Sure. So thanks, Chris. Um, as I mentioned, kind of due to both the demand and the high frequency of hail in the United States, that's why the area of the United States and the 11 target states were selected and focused on in the first round. Um, but we're, we certainly know that hail can affect many more locations than just the one that Cole had highlighted on the map. Um, I think our, our next logical expansion is going to be to Canada. Given the uh, frequency and severity of hail events up there, I understand there was recently a pretty severe hail event in the province of Alberta. Um, so to me, that's the next, next logical expansion location. And I would say beyond that, we don't necessarily have a timeline or a geographic priority list, um, although we are aware that there is both interest and uh, demand in certain European countries, parts of Latin America, and Australia as well. Great. Thank, thank you, Megan. And I think for the audience, uh, just, you know, Expect for us to update you as this product, the footprint of the product offering grows. We will uh, we'll make sure to keep everybody apprised of that. Uh, so, Curtis, a question about CoreLogic here. Um, and the question is, what is the resolution of data that CoreLogic is using to define the trigger? 
Yeah, that's a, a great question. So uh, we have uh, developed, as, as Megan uh, hit on, a proprietary algorithm that uh, really accumulates a, a variety of different uh, quality of, of weather data. So whether that comes in from the, the National Weather Service's weather radar network with the dual pole uh, weather radar networks across the U.S., um, whether it's a ground observation coming in from a, uh, a source, uh, whether it be social media, or maybe even a ground sensor that that uh, technology is now advancing to where you actually are deploying sensors to measure hail sizes. Um, so all of those work into our, our algorithm, and we output a resolution, we output that data, uh, the forensic data of what actually did happen on a five, uh, 500 meter resolution. Uh, and that does allow us to go in and ping um, and get uh, you know, real granular information uh, really all the way down to the, the property level in terms of the, the maximum hail size. Great, thanks, Curtis. Appreciate that. Um, and so, Megan, how about one back over to you? Um, do you need to buy a traditional uh, property policy in order to buy a, a hail parametric? No, hail parametric policies can be written on a standalone basis. Uh, this holds true for all parametric policies. We have uh, executed deals where the client only buys a parametric cover and it is perfectly acceptable to do so. So even if you don't purchase traditional indemnity cover from us or you don't purchase traditional indemnity cover to cover that specific peril, you are able to and we can work together to design a parametric hail product that suits your needs. Thanks, Megan. Do you mind if I stick with you for one more here? There's a question about um, the underwriting uh, information needs. So the question is, is knowing the roof square footage a necessary underwriting item? For parametric hail, no, because, um, and this, this holds true for any parametric product. When we, when we underwrite a parametric product, the main component that's going to play into the risk assessment is going to be the probability of an of a given event occurring whether or not that event is a hurricane an earthquake or a hailstorm so the key piece of information that we need to determine the probability of a severe hail earthquake hurricane event occurring is where your location is located that's going to be the underlying driver of the risk assessment and ultimately the price. Places in Florida are much more exposed to hurricane than places in Maine, just like places in Oklahoma are much more exposed to hail than in Massachusetts. Great. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Cole, now a question over to you. How do you determine the appropriate payout table? Yeah, really good question. And this, this dovetails actually quite nicely with, with uh, Megan's last answer uh, in, the, in the previous question. So um, the, the short answer is we work very closely together with the broker and the insured to, to design a payout table that makes the most sense for the insured. Now, how do we actually do that? So, so there's many different ways. Um, you know, for example, for an auto dealer, um, you know, we, we think we have a pretty good idea, and most auto dealers will as well, uh, if you talk to them, pretty good idea of where you start to see pretty significant auto damage, for example, right, at a, a maximum hail size of, you know, roughly one and a quarter inch, you start to see some pretty significant damage where they're going to have to repair it, you know, they can't just sell the car, you know, at a, at a slight discount, right, it, it, it becomes a little bit more significant. And then, you know, we, we also have a pretty good sense for where they start to see really bad damage, right? So um, the vulnerability of, of a, a typical car um, is, is pretty well known. And so that kind of helps us work with the insured and the broker to set up a, a reasonable payout table for, for that particular class of business. I'll give you another example on the solar side. You know, typically solar manufacturers will have uh, in their specifications, they'll, they'll give a, a sense for where the, the hail size at which you might expect to start to see significant damage to a panel, right? Um, and so that, that kind of underwriting information, while Megan's spot on that it doesn't actually impact the, the, the risk assessment, but what it does help us do is set up the payout table in, in a way that makes the most sense for the insured. Um, and in a way that, that, that minimizes a risk that we call basis risk or, or the risk that 
the parametric payout doesn't match up with the insured's loss, right? And, and we, we try to match those up uh, as, as closely as reasonably possible. Uh, it's, it's never going to be 100%, uh, but, but, you know, we try to use the data available in working with the insured and the broker to design those such that they make sense for the underlying risk, right? So, so the, the answer, Chris, would be it's, it's a very close collaboration with the broker and the insured um, based on the, the individual risk that we're looking at, um, and, and then we would kind of use that information to set an appropriate payout table. Great, thanks, Cole. Uh, Megan, uh, is the, the traditional property loss payment reduced from what is collectible on the parametric cover for the same event day out? No. Um, we've, worded our, we've worded our contracts so that they function as a very broad difference in condition cover or differences in condition cover. Um, and we do not make the payout contingent on inuring to any sort of traditional uh, property policy because in general, as Cole mentioned earlier in the conversa conversation, parametric cover can cover a much broader range of incurred losses than a traditional property policy. Cole, one for you now. Uh, is the policy written on uh, an annual aggregate and or occurrence limit? And how often are typical policy terms offered for? Yeah, good question. So um, as of right now, we're only considering single year. Um, so for our typical parametric policies, so hurricane and earthquake, for example, we very frequently execute on a multi-year basis. Um, for hail, you know, this is a brand new product. Uh, we do want to walk before we run. Uh, in other words, I, I would love to be able to come to the market next year and say we can offer more instead of um, – <laughs> We, we, uh, we ran too, too fast, too quickly, and we stumbled, and now we actually have to pull back. And so, you know, when we launch these new products, we are fairly careful. We, we want to learn together with our clients. Um, and, and so uh, the, the, the short answer is we only offer one year at this point. Uh, we hope in the future that will change as we get a bit more uh, comfortable, build a little bit more of a portfolio. So single year right now. Um, and these are typically structured as aggregate limits, right? So, so it's effectively the insured has one shot at the full limit in a given policy year. Um, now, if, for example, you know, you saw the payout table earlier, if, for example, the insured has a 25% loss, right, uh, in a given hailstorm, they would still have 75% left, Right? So, so if they have a partial loss, they still have a part of that aggregate left for a future event. But typically it is aggregated uh, to, to kind of one times the occurrence limit, if you will. Cole, thank you so much for that. Uh, we have a number of questions that we didn't get to. We didn't have time to get to during Q&A, so we will respond to you each individually um, in the coming week. Um, Cole, Megan, uh, thank you so much for your presentations, um, and Curtis McDonald from CoreLogic for joining us to answer questions during Q&A. Uh, great job. I, I hope the audience found that very, uh, to be very insightful. Um, we will have a recording available to you uh, in the coming days if you want to listen again or share with any colleagues who might have interest. And in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to me or any of today's presenters with questions. We'd be more than happy to continue the conversation with you. Um, and if you have just a few moments here um, and you could complete a, uh, a survey to let us know what you thought of today's uh, session, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, so for the month of August, we're going to take a brief summer break from webinars, uh, but we're going to pick right back up in the fall with uh, a couple of events largely based on the feedback that we've collected through these, uh, through these webinars. The first will be on September 9th on the topic of claims fraud. Uh, and then again on September 23rd, we're going to take a deep dive into parametric solutions. So we'll go, um, you know, we had a parametric webinar uh, several weeks back. We're going to go deeper with more case studies um, and detail into that solution set. So stay tuned for the invites. Please keep an eye out on the Corp Swiss Re Corporate Solutions LinkedIn account. And thank you so much again for joining us. Um, we hope to speak with you soon and enjoy the rest of your week. Take care.